Well, as I mentioned before, uh, as we go along, we'll be getting deeper and deeper into the information. Um, our next presenter is going to be talking about the, more about the marketplace and specifically about the benefits and what exactly are people shopping for. Um, and the goal of this, from my point of view, is to help you better understand what you'll be looking at, what people you're working with will be looking at, so you can kind of help, help them think about how to compare things. Um, so today we have Philip Bergquist, who is the Director of Health Center Operations for the Michigan Primary Care Association, and that's all I'll say. Good morning. I need to get a little taller. Okay, there we go. <laughs> well, I'm Philip Burquest from the Michigan Primary Care Association. Uh, the Primary Care Association works with community-based healthcare providers all across the state of Michigan. So I have the pleasure of representing federally qualified health centers, look-alike organizations, uh, all sorts of folks in that, in that world. Um, and I also have the opportunity to represent the state of Michigan and community-based providers with CMS. So as this process has unfolded as an advisory panel member to the administrator of CMS, I've been able to look a little bit behind the curtain, uh, which has been a fascinating experience, um, and, but it does give me some, some interesting insights on how things have developed. So as Ruth said, I'm gonna talk specifically about the health insurance marketplace. Um, and I think that you guys touched on these numbers before, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what things look like statewide and, and locally in Washtenaw County. So I always like to, to point out the number of eligible but uninsured children we still have in the state of Michigan. Uh, nothing's changing for children or pregnant women or infants. Their coverage remains the same. So Medicaid eligibility levels, my child eligibility levels, all, all of that stuff is exactly the same. But we do still have a population of almost 70,000 uninsured kids that could enroll today. Literally all 70,000 of them. Well, that would probably crash the system, but Theoretically, all 70,000 of them could enroll today and they would be eligible for coverage. Um, we anticipate that what, uh, what our colleagues have called the woodwork effect will happen, whereas more of these adults between Medicaid and tax credits get enrolled in coverage, they will bring their children with them. So these, some of these kids that have remained outside of the health insurance system just because they haven't needed health insurance or it's not been a priority for their family will get enrolled in either Medicaid or My Child coverage simply because their parents are now interacting for the first time and their parents are having the opportunity to enroll for the first time. Um, it also doesn't hurt that parents would face a penalty for not having their kids enrolled. So that is certainly a motivator as well, although that penalty is not very much money initially. Uh, it does expand as we go throughout, throughout the years from here on out. Um, for all of these kids, the 69,000 number that I gave you, all of those kids would be eligible for Medicaid or My Child. So they would be free or coverage for $10 a month. So huge incentive for parents to get those kids enrolled. 450,000 plus uh, Medicaid potential beneficiaries, and that's about as much as I'm gonna say about Medicaid, because I know you guys are gonna spend a lot of time in the afternoon talking about Medicaid. But what I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about is this group of folks right here, 745,000 folks that are potentially eligible for some sort of subsidy in the health insurance marketplace to buy coverage. And I say buy coverage intentionally because the health insurance marketplace is really meant to be a place for people to shop. Um, it is not a, uh, not a Medicaid-like product. It's not a chip-like product. Uh, it is truly a place where people can go, figure out how much tax credit they're eligible for, and pick a plan based on a lot of different things. And we're going to look at how people compare those plans. But in terms of income, um, I think you guys heard this this morning, we have Medicaid eligibility up to 138%, and then within the marketplace, subsidies up to 400%, although we're gonna talk a lot about the group um, that's from 100 to 250%, because there are some different types of subsidies available for our lower income folks in the marketplace. So in Washtenaw County, I just wanted to put this out there, um, in terms of currently uninsured, under 65 and under 400%, so this is the group of people that are most impacted by coverage expansion, just over 25,000 people. Um, 
So almost 7,500 eligible for Medicaid expansion and almost 21,000 eligible for a tax credit in the marketplace. Now, everybody that's a math person can see that those numbers add up to more than 25,000. And that's because there's a group of people that are between 100 and 138 percent of poverty that are both eligible for Medicaid and a tax credit in the marketplace. So we can talk about kind of how that works. Um, what we anticipate will happen is many of those folks will initially sign up for coverage in the marketplace while we're waiting for Medicaid expansion to take effect in Michigan. And then when Medicaid becomes available, they'll switch to Medicaid. Um, that's what we anticipate will happen, but I don't have a crystal ball either. So um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. And these, if you're interested in sort of looking at this data in any more level of detail or looking for it in different places, I've included where I got it from. Um, all great sources. Another way to look at this, uh, and a tool that I would really very much suggest that you take advantage of, is this visualization tool that's been put forward by the Kaiser Family Foundation. So if you want to look down to a neighborhood or a community or an area around your facility, you can zoom in on this map to the point where you're getting down to a zip code level. And then in urban areas, uh, you can get even lower down than a zip code level to statistical areas. It's a very, uh, very powerful tool because it shows you variation locally in terms of, you know, I live in Lansing. Um, I work five miles down the road from where I live. The zip code that I live in has a coverage eligibility level that's almost 20% of the population, but five miles down the road where I work, it's only 13%. So there's huge variation locally within five miles of one another. Um, but, you know, based on where you are and the, the economic and demographic groups that are present in that area. So, and I should say, feel free to interrupt me at any time, because I tend to get on a roll, and, and then I'll just be talking very quickly. Um, so ask questions, interrupt, I like to keep it very informal. Um, so what is this marketplace? So the, the concept is that people should be able to compare health insurance options. And the thing that's different about this, so Everybody that shopped for health insurance in the individual marketplace has probably experienced eHealthInsurance.com. So what's different from the marketplace in eHealthInsurance.com? It's a true apples to apples comparison. That's something we've never had before and we won't have until it opens on October 1st. When you're shopping for private health insurance right now, you go from company to company to company or you use a service like eHealth Insurance and you get information from each one of those companies that was generated by that corporation. The health insurance marketplace takes all of the information on those products and plans and standardizes it so that they can literally compare apples to apples across your screen, plan one, plan two, plan three. Here's the deductible in plan one. Here's the deductible in plan two. Here's three. So you can make an informed decision. We've never had that before. Um, and it's a pretty exciting thing because Statistically, and, and sort of based on historical perspective, when we can give people information so that they can make informed decisions, they make better decisions about their health coverage. Um, and that's a, that's a very exciting and very important part of the health insurance marketplace. So most people that go to the marketplace, well over 90%, they're gonna be eligible for a break on costs. And that break on costs is either gonna come through a tax credit or a cost sharing subsidy. And there are two different pieces to this. Um, we talk a lot about tax credits, and when you hear things on the news, you hear tax credits, tax credits, tax credits, over and over and over again. But those cost-sharing subsidies for our low-income population are probably even more important than the tax credit, and we can talk about why. Um, again, open enrollment begins October 1st, so everybody knows that date. It's only 12 days away. It ends March 31st, so we have six months for this very first open enrollment period, but every subsequent open enrollment period is much shorter. It mimics the Medicare open enrollment, so we're looking at October 15th to December 7th. So there's huge difference. We have six months this first time around. Next time around, we're gonna have roughly two months. Marianne touched on, uh-oh, automatically. Okay, we'll go backwards. <laughs> Marianne touched on uh, plans that are gonna be sold in the marketplace. We can't tell you for sure that every single one of these plans are gonna be qualified health plans. What we know about them is that they apply to sell products in the marketplace. As Marianne said, we're not gonna know exactly who and what until uh, October 1st and until the marketplace opens. Can we get this to stop going so far? Yeah. 
Um, Is there a way to change the settings? <coughs> you have a question, go ahead. I do. So, um, in terms of the products that are presented, they're going to be apples to apples. Um, so, I'm going to assume that there's going to be some cost differential in the Yep. Are there going to be any additional comparisons like uh, user ratings or something like that? There are. So in addition to like a whole range of costs that you can compare, you can compare provider directories or sort of network capacity. So for example, if it's important to somebody that certain healthcare providers are in that plan's network, they can actually look at the plan's network online. So that's a feature that every single plan will put out there. Um, if plans have quality information that they've put forward, you should be able to look at that. I say that should be able to because there are some new plans. There are plans that have not been plans before amongst this group of people. So those new plans obviously aren't gonna have quality information, but for some of the ones that have been around for a little while, you should be able to look at that as well. I know provider sort of capacity, provider network is really important to a lot of people. Um, and that is something that you can compare on the basis of as well, in addition to all of the cost stuff. And then you can look at, um, cost sharing for different types of services. So cost sharing in terms of how much is an office visit gonna come cost me? How much would an ER visit cost me? How much would an admission cost me? What's the difference between not only a deductible or an out-of-pocket maximum, but how much I'm physically gonna pay for different types of services? So these uh, 14 plans, Marianne's had hundreds of options amongst these 14 plans. I think what it's important to note is that not every single plan is gonna be available in every single area. It's just like, for example, Medicaid right now, where not every Medicaid qualified health plan is available in every county. Health insurance is something that is local. It is local by nature. So not every single one of these plans are gonna offer plans in every county in the state of Michigan. Very, actually quite a few of them are focused on geographic areas, they're focused on particular segments of the population. So an example of that would be Molina Healthcare. They're, they're looking very strongly at Southeast Michigan and then they're also looking at a lower income scale of the marketplace. So they're not hoping to serve people at 350% of the poverty level in the Upper Peninsula. That's not where they want. That's not the folks that they're going after as a plan. They're looking at lower income folks in Southeast Michigan and sort of metro areas that extend from there. Um, there are sort of several examples of plans that are doing similar things. Consumers Mutual uh, is a new plan, it's a co-op, the first time that we've had grr, <laughs> a um, uh, you know, nonprofit co-op running in the state of Michigan. Um, obviously some of these plans will be statewide. So if we look at Blue Cross, Blue Care Network, uh, those sort of very large institutionalized across the entire state plans. They will, they will be here, they will be statewide. You'll be able to find a Blue Cross product just about anywhere you want to find one. And those, those sorts of decisions are really made by the plan. So nothing says that every qualified health plan has to be available everywhere. Um, and nothing says that they have to sell products in every single category. So many of them won't sell products in every single category. They'll focus on particular segments of that market. All right, so we touched on essential health benefits this morning. I think you guys are probably relatively familiar with these 10 categories. If they haven't sort of been locked into your brain yet, uh, these are the 10 things that health plans are required to cover. Now, in Michigan and in every state, the state had to select a plan that is basically the benchmark. So how do we define essential health benefits in the state of Michigan? What I wanna say about this is that the essential health benefits were not designed to mimic Medicaid. They weren't designed to mimic Medicare. They weren't designed to mimic my child. They were designed to mimic a typical employer plan. So the coverage that you have, that I have, as a result of being covered by my employer. And that coverage looks very different. So in the state of Michigan, the Department of Insurance and Financial Services selected the Priority Health HMO product as our benchmark plan. And that product didn't have every single one of those 10 categories. So they had to add some things to it. So we know, for example, pediatric vision services are required. Well, Priority Health HMO didn't cover pediatric vision services. So they added this 
Fed VIP Blue Vision High as the vision product to make up our benchmark plan. They didn't, Priority Health HMO didn't have dental services covered for children. So they added to that, that base plan the same coverage as would be in the My Child Dental Program. So they've supplemented it to make sure that it meets all of those 10 things. Now, what do those 10 things mean in practicality? This is a really great resource if you have more questions about what that means. So when the state went through this process of selecting a plan, they had lots of options to pick from. They had all sorts of options to pick from when they picked this benchmark plan. And they put together a report in a chart that actually details all of the different options that they had to select from and shows how Priority Health HMO stacks up. So if you're interested, and I know you can't see this on the slide, so nobody can, but you have the link to it right here. Um, if you wanna know, does Priority Health HMO cover this kind of specialty visit? This chart shows you that. And that's a really easy way to sort of see what is Priority Health HMO look like? What exactly are these essential health benefits going to amount to in a general sense? We won't be able to tell you exactly what every single one of these plans covers until October 1st. But this is probably the closest thing we have that shows us what, what's the makeup of an essential health benefit based on our benchmark plan in the state of Michigan. So it's a great resource to use before October 1st. Obviously, after October 1st, you can actually go to the marketplace and look at those plans. And that's the thing that I would encourage you to do is look at those plans. Go ahead. All of the plans, look at that, the slide automatically changed to your question. <laughs> so all of the plans meet a, a, like a minimum threshold. So Marianne said 60% is the minimum actuarial value that we're looking for, for them to meet the standard of some sort of comprehensive coverage. All of the plans in the marketplace are gonna meet that 60% standard. And these are in ranges. When, you, when people describe it, we often use the middle number. So the bronze plan says 58 to 62%. As Marianne said this morning, she referred to it as 60. Just about everybody just says 60. And the same thing for silver. So when people refer to the actuarial value of a silver plan, they almost always say 70. I'm gonna keep up with it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> um, so what, is, what do these metal levels and the actuarial values mean? Uh, actuarial value is the generosity of the benefits covered by a plan. So in general, the percentage that you see, so we'll take a silver plan, the actuarial value is 70%. That means that the plan is gonna cover 70% of the cost of the healthcare, whereas the person, through either out-of-pocket expenses like co-insurance and co-pays and deductibles, is gonna pay the other 30%. And they're arranged in metal levels because those fancier sounding metal levels have higher actuarial values. So the higher that metal level, the higher the cost of the premium and the lower the cost of the outpatient expenses. And this is kind of a visual way to see that. So we have bronze on the very far end, down at 60%. For a bronze plan, you're not gonna pay a very high premium. Your premium's gonna be pretty cheap, but you're gonna pay a lot of out of pocket. You're gonna have a high deductible probably, you're gonna have high co-pays and co-insurance for the visits and the services that you get. When we go up to platinum, you're gonna pay a lot in a premium, uh, comparatively speaking, to a bronze plan, and you're not gonna pay a lot out of pocket. Um, they're gonna have a low cost for services. These kind of gold and platinum plans, they're more of what we think about as really great employer-sponsored coverage, the plans where we're having an office visit that only cost us $10. Though that's a really great amount. Um, wouldn't we all love to have that plan? Um, the bronze plans, it, I don't think it would be outside the realm of possibility for one of those office visits to cost 50 or, uh, 40 or $50. So it sort of depends on where you fall into that scale. So the last thing I'd like to say just sort of about this chart is that the silver plan, we're gonna talk a lot about the silver plan because the silver plan is where everything is based. 
all of the tax credits, all of the cost sharing subsidies, everything is based on the cost of the second lowest silver plan. Again, the marketplace does not open until October 1st. We have no idea what that cost is. We have some estimates based on the current health insurance cost of products, but it is important to know that everything is based on that silver plan. So the amount of tax credits that people are eligible for, the amount of cost sharing subsidies, everything on the cost of the silver plan. So how do things get cheaper for people? In the category of 100 to 200%, 250% of poverty, we have premium tax credits and cost sharing subsidies. We're gonna talk about both of these in depth. From 250 to 400%, we only have tax credits. So our folks that are lowest income, that may be just sort of teetering between the difference of Medicaid expansion and health insurance marketplace, they're gonna be eligible for a lower price through cost sharing subsidies than somebody would at a higher income who's just getting those tax credits. So tax credits, uh, to, use, to use a tax credit or to get a tax credit, you have to buy coverage from the health insurance marketplace. Um, this has gotten a, just a teensy bit more complicated in the last couple of weeks because the federal government has set up the, the marketplace for the state of Michigan. So we're in a federal partnership marketplace. So our marketplace lives at healthcare.gov. That's where our people in the state of Michigan are gonna go to buy coverage, healthcare.gov. In the last little while, the federal government has also contracted with two private marketplaces. So in addition to healthcare.gov, you can go to two other websites and also get access to a tax credit in the plans in the health insurance marketplace. I say that so that you know they're out there. So it's uh, Go eHealth and I think it's eHealth uh, Insurance are the two private ones that they've contracted with. I want you to know that those are out there, um, but I would strongly encourage you to use healthcare.gov. We don't know what all of the rules and regulations are gonna be around the private exchanges right now. We don't know if, for example, those private exchanges are gonna help facilitate people's enrollment in Medicaid or CHIP if they happen to go to the wrong place. We know that the federal government contracted and sort of put them out there because they wanted people to have some other options. And I think they're also, um, they're pretty you know, prominent places that people go to get health insurance right now in the individual market. So they wanted to have some continuity. When you have people coming into this market right now for the first time, I would very strongly encourage you to use healthcare.gov. So as Marianne said, you have several options when you go to the marketplace on how you use your tax credit. You can take the whole thing up front. So say we're eligible for $8,000 in tax credit, you can take that whole $8,000 right when you apply. You can take none of it, um, and you can just get that as a credit on your taxes. So, for example, student we many of us get student loan interest credits, and we get that at the end of the year, and it counts against our income taxes. You can do the same thing with the health insurance tax credit. The disadvantage to that is that it doesn't make your health insurance any cheaper, cheaper between now and the end of the year. You're just getting that tax credit on your income taxes. You're paying full price for your health insurance. What most people are likely to do is use a portion of the credit. And the reason that you would want to use a portion is because these tax credits, like all taxes, get reconciled at the end of the year. So if you go to the health insurance marketplace on October 2nd and you say, I'm gonna make $25,000 this year, and then a week later, you get a raise. It's your great day of the week and now you make $32,000 a year you're no longer eligible for the amount of tax credit that the marketplace said you were a week ago. 
And that means that if you, if you use all of that tax credit, if you don't report your income change and you just continue proceeding down the road um, and don't report that, you're gonna have to pay that tax credit back, a portion of that tax credit back at the end of the year. Did we fix it? disconnected the little clicker USB thing, the interference would go away, if it is that. Like, it pulled it out of the computer, so that the thing next door couldn't talk to the computer. Oh, it's advanced I don't. You do, and perhaps it would be easier to take it out than to follow along with <laughs> this madness. <laughs> Go ahead. It's the tax credit, so we have a lot of people who don't have to file taxes. Mm -hmm. So I have multiple answers to that question. Um, if you are below the federal filing limit for taxes, so if you're actually not required by law to file taxes, you don't face a penalty for not having health insurance, and that's the first thing you should know. So if you're below the federal filing limit, you don't technically have to have health insurance. Also, if you're below the federal filing limit, you're eligible for Medicaid. So that's the first part to know. If it's a person who should have been filing taxes and hasn't, um, it's an advanced tax credit. So it's a tax credit that is coming in advance. So how just about every tax credit works right now is that you get it afterward. You complete the whole year and then you file taxes when that year is over and you get the tax credit retroactively. How this one works is we're gonna apply, say on October 2nd, our coverage is gonna start January 1st and it's gonna go through the end of the year and we're gonna get that tax credit in advance. So you don't have to have filed taxes when you apply on October 2nd, but at the end of the year, you're going to need to file taxes. And so the people, like for some of our folks who haven't filed for a year, there'll be penalties for not filing. So when they have to file, will those, all those penalties catch up with them? That I don't know. That's a tax question. <laughs> um, but the IRS, they are taking those questions. So. The, the way the marketplace works is it's sort of a conglomeration of a lot of different federal agencies. So the IRS is working on this, CMS is working on this, several divisions within CMS, the Department of the Treasury, the Social Security Administration, DHS, sort of everybody is working on it. And the IRS promulgated the portion of the rules related to taxes. So that would be a really good sort of tax question to ask. Um, my guess would be yes. That would be my guess, but I don't know that for sure. Because none of the tax rules have changed. So if they should have been filing taxes and they are going to face a penalty when they file taxes, none of that has changed. I would just add to that, though, John, that um, a, lot of, a lot of people who are very low income who don't file taxes are, they actually would get other credits as sure. well. Sure. And there aren't penalties if the IRS owes you money. So EITC, for example, it would be one that that group of folks would be highly eligible for. Was there another question over here? So, yeah, I was wondering, so is, is the IRS sort of indirectly using this as an opportunity to incentivize people who should be filing taxes but aren't to file taxes? <laughs> I've never heard anybody say that out loud. <laughs> It is it's certainly a plausible question. We will never get anybody to say that out loud. So I can't answer it. We can think that. No IRS person is ever going to say that. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, yeah, because that would certainly not be uh, the most politically correct thing to say. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that the result, the result. Uh, is that more people will file taxes. Yeah. All right, Are we, we're working again? Yeah, we're awesome. Okay, awesome. So I wanted to just provide a couple of examples of different sort of income scenarios and what these tax credits might look like. And I think it would be helpful if you took out this sheet right here, which is all of the federal poverty level categories, because I did these in dollars. <laughs> so I'm gonna start at the, the bottom with an annual income of 16,000 for a person that's so a one person household. Um, and if you look at your chart for the household size, 16,000 puts that person just above Medicaid eligibility. And I think this is, uh, this is an important group. So the people that are sort of just above Medicaid eligibility, but definitely at the lower income end of people that will be using the marketplace. They're the same thing, so it doesn't matter. I have one that looks like this. There are, there's another one that's a smaller chart. Um, they both have the same things on them. Tax household. Tax household. Yep. So if spouses are filing separately, then they can go off the one household file. If they're joint filing, they go off the two. It, you would, it would be whatever the tax household is. Okay. So the actual file separately does change that. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So for one person, this, this one person at $16,000 a year, Again, these are estimated costs based on the current health insurance market. And I use the Kaiser Family Foundation subsidy calculator in case you wanna run a couple scenarios yourself. I do this all the time. Sometimes I just run across people and I'm like, I wonder what they would pay. Let's find out. <laughs> um, so just somebody just above the Medicaid eligibility threshold at 16,000, the cost of their coverage is estimated to be 4,358. The tax credit that they're eligible for is $3,819, which means that they owe $539 a year, and that amounts to $45 per month. So this is tax credits before cost sharing, just talking about tax credits right now. So is that affordable? I don't know. I guess it's that's for that person to know. Um, what I can tell you about the scenarios that I did are as I picked middle-aged people, so all the people in my scenario are 45 years old, um, and none of them smoke. So if you are 55 and a smoker, there's no way you're paying $45 a month. Um, smoking increases the, the premium rating typically by a half. So if I would have paid $500 and I'm a smoker, I'm gonna pay 750 as a general rule. Um, and there are age bands. So the older you are, the more you're gonna pay for coverage. So there were a lot of things removed as to how health insurance companies can rate their products and how they can come up with those rates. But age and tobacco use are big ones that really impact a lot of people, and those didn't go away. There are also, just so you're aware, rating markets within the state of Michigan. So geographically, there are different markets where different rates are appropriate because it may cost more or less to pay for somebody's care in Southeast Michigan than it does to pay for that care in Escanaba. Okay. But I just want to clarify, because I think the last one said it. So if your employer offers insurance, whether you take it or not, you don't qualify for the tax credit. Correct, as long as the insurance meets the affordability standard. For one person. So Mary, I think that's a really important clarification that Mary Ann said, is that the IRS based the rules on one person. Because the employer said, we have no idea what somebody's household income is. We know what we pay the person that works for us. So that, that income standard is based on that person. As part of household income, for young adults who are not living in their parents' homes, college students, for example, who are uh, counted as dependents on their parents' income tax, they need to use their parents' Are we assuming that they don't themselves file taxes? Yes, we're, we're assuming that they do not. So then they would be part of that household with their but parents. They do file taxes even though they are included on their parents' income tax, they, they don't have to use their parents' income? Yeah, so for young adults under age 26, mm -hmm. it's very unlikely that they would come to the marketplace in the first place because they're able to stay on their parents' plan. Mm -hmm. 
So they're going to want to come um, to purchase something themselves. I would say for most students, so if we're going to take that scenario, because that's one I can answer for sure, um, for most students that are making very little money, they're going to qualify for Medicaid. So the tax credit question is not going to be a big deal for them. But mom, dad, claim your money, right? And financially, it's actually by their parents and mom, not theirs. So it's, so it's based on the adult's income for Medicaid. So if it's a student who's profoundly low income, i.e. that student works 10 hours a week at Big B, um, they're not gonna make enough money that they wouldn't qualify for Medicaid. So then that student's <laughs> gonna qualify for Medicaid. If the student is working enough that they would be out of that Medicaid eligibility, then you're right, they would be in their parents' household because that's the tax household. Go ahead. Correct. That would include those children who are up to 27. Absolutely correct. But they're not obligated to. But they're not obligated to. Thank also you. correct. <laughs> so within the one scenario that you described, we could find probably eight or nine different ways for that person to go. Yeah. So what we do know is that, so like let's just think about basic sliding scale math here. More people in a household at the same income level makes you eligible for more things, right? More people, same income, more eligibility. So that, that person or that, that household is gonna be eligible for more in tax credit because they have more people. Um, so it probably makes sense for them to buy a family plan if their employer coverage doesn't cover that child up to age 26. I can't answer that without the actual person. So what I would say to that person is, we need to fill out an application and see what the actual costs are. We need to look at what your employer offers you, how much it costs to add your college-aged kid there, look at the marketplace, see how much tax credit we're eligible for in the marketplace and how much it's gonna cost there, and weigh the options. Or if that college-aged child is eligible for Medicaid, maybe that's the best option for them, and you continue with the employer-sponsored coverage that you have but it's really hard to talk about it in an abstract. So you really want to look at every single one of those options for that individual family. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. So if, if, um, if mom has a lot of healthcare issues, she can go to a planned plan, and dad and the kids can go to a silver plan, right? Does it have to be the same thing? No. What, what I can tell you, though, is that the, the amount of tax credits that you're eligible for is based on the silver plan. So if mom picks a platinum plan, she's going to pay more for that. Yeah, it doesn't have to be the, the same company. You can pick differently. Go ahead. Well, based upon the uh, various questions and scenarios, how big is this health risk? <laughs> At the federal level? Within the marketplace? That's the question. It's huge. It's um, the highest amount of cubicles that I've ever seen in one place. <coughs> it's massive. Managed by a, managed by CMS, but staffed by a government contractor, which is how things are done now. Um, it's not only a phone help desk; it's also a live chat help desk. So you sort of have some options as to how you want to get that help. In addition to the people that are being funded to provide that help in person in communities. So it's a lot of pieces to that system. So we have navigators, certified application counselors in the state of Michigan that are providing help in person. We have our federal call center number through healthcare.gov. We have live chat on healthcare.gov. And then within the state of Michigan in the Department of Insurance and Financial Services, there's a grievance. So if you have a complaint about one of these health insurance companies and you feel like you're being taken advantage of or you don't feel like they're actually covering all of the EHBs appropriately, there's a grievance process there and there's also a health insurance consumer assistance program within the state that does relatively the same thing. So there's lots of options for people. Can I tell you, so at not, I'm not saying this as an advisor to the federal government, can I tell you that it's gonna be able to handle millions of people calling at the same time? No way. There's no help center out there that will be able to do that. So I imagine that there will be periods of time um, where there are long waits to get that question answered on the phone or to chat with somebody in real time because there are only so many people that are doing that job. 
there are a lot of them. The biggest you know, group that I've ever seen, it's bigger than the Medicare call center based on the same kind of framework and how, how things are actually working. So it's tiered customer service within kind of algorithms and scripts and defined information on how people answer questions so that you're getting consistency across all of those customer service representatives. But I can't tell you for sure that every single question is gonna be answered within five minutes. I think it'll be better than five days. No idea. So far, they haven't. Yeah. So I mean, so far, they they live in the DC area. So. So a couple of other sort of households to think about. Um, I thought this is a this is a group that I see a lot, which is uh, a married couple that doesn't have kids um, and that but are low income. So if we go back to our chart for two people at $31,900, that puts them just over 200%, meaning that this, this household would have some cost sharing reduction, but if we look just at their tax credits, we see the estimated amount of their coverage is 8,716, their subsidy or their tax credit, 7,713, and they're looking at about $84 per month. Again, these are non-smokers, middle-aged non-smokers. And obviously, you know, this is just to illustrate the top end. So we have a four person household. This is a household where I had two parents and two kids and they make more money than those kids would be eligible for my child. So those kids are gonna buy a family plan in the exchange or in the health insurance marketplace. And they're towards the top end of the tax credit. So we can see that for the, that family, the cost of their coverage is pretty high, almost 13,000. But because of their income, they're only eligible for just over 4,000 in tax credit and their monthly premium is very high. So there's a whole range here um, of potential scenarios in terms of how this, how this really works out. The same thing for, for this down here at the bottom. So the, again, this is our, our single person, our one person household, but at $27,000, they are closer to 300% of poverty and that closer to 300% of property is gonna get them a premium for one person that's almost 200 bucks. So there's a whole range, whole range of scenarios. And again, this is tax credits without any cost sharing, which is what we're gonna talk about next. So again, they're based on the silver plan. Um, and I know Marianne put this in here. I just wanted to just touch on this concept in that the, the tax credit is not, um, it's not a preconceived amount. So it's an amount that is really based on the cost of that silver plan and your income. And how the, it's, just, it's just pretty straightforward math. So for example, if we have somebody that's at 150% of poverty, their premium is allowed to cost four to 6.3% of their income. So their tax credit is gonna be the premium, that, that unsubsidized cost of the premium minus the amount that they are allowed to pay based on this chart. So say the plan is $6,000 and based on their income, they are allowed to pay $3,000. They're gonna say $6,000 for the cost of the plan minus the amount that you're okay to pay equals your tax credit. So I know not extremely straightforward, but also <laughs> pretty straightforward. And again, cost of the second lowest silver plan. So cost sharing subsidies are a second piece of making these plans more affordable in the marketplace. Um, and the concept behind the cost sharing subsidies is not to reduce the price of the premium, it's to reduce what somebody pays out of pocket. So the tax credits function on the premium. That's the point of the tax credits, they make the premium cheaper. The cost sharing subsidies reduce things like deductible coinsurance, and coinsurance is a percentage whereas a copay is a flat amount of fee. So Medicare has coinsurance. Medicare pays 80, everybody else pays 20. Uh, a copay is, it costs you $10 to go to the doctor's office and that's a flat fee. Um, they're only available to people 250% of the poverty line or below, but also American Indians and Alaskan Natives. So if you serve a population that is that audience of American Indians and Alaskan Natives, they're eligible for cost sharing at no matter what income level they fall. Um, and it's only applied if they buy a silver level plan. So this is extremely important. 
um, because I assume that many of you are gonna be interacting with people as they make the decision on which plan they're gonna buy. And if you have somebody at 200% of poverty, they're gonna get a tax credit, they're eligible for cost sharing, but if they decide, for example, the bronze plan is gonna be free for me, so I'm gonna pick the bronze plan, they're not gonna get cost sharing because you have to pick the silver plan, a silver plan. There will be lots of them available. Um, if you don't pick that, you don't get the cost sharing. And the thing to balance here for folks and help people understand is that while the silver plan, based on you know, the tax credit that you're eligible for, might have a slightly higher premium, you're gonna wind up paying a lot less over time because you're paying less out of your pocket throughout the year. That's a really hard thing for people to see up front. They see the sticker price, right? That's, that's what we all see, we see the sticker price. So if I'm, my tax credit's based on the silver plan, I'm really low income, and I go and pick the bronze plan, my tax credit may completely offset the premium of that bronze plan. And it would be very appealing for me to pick the one that is zero premium. But in that bronze plan, I'm not gonna get any of that cost sharing. So I'm gonna have a really high deductible. It's gonna cost me a lot of money to go to the doctor. And that's not gonna work out for people in the long run. So there's gonna need to be some counseling with folks and sort of working through the fact that the sticker price is one thing, but let's, for example, what's the copay of that bronze plan? And how many times do you go, did you go to the doctor last year? So in addition to you know, what was covered in premium, you're gonna have to pay another $150 in copays. And then what if you got admitted to the hospital? You would have to pay this deductible before the plan took over on your costs. That's the kind of thing that we're gonna to have to do with people to help them understand. Based on your income, so three and four percent is that one thirty-three to one fifty. As an employer, my mandate is to provide insurance at no more than nine point five percent, right? Yep. So by offering a plan, and I don't have a lot of money to pay my staff, so most of them will probably fare better on the margin plan. By offering a plan, I actually shortcut their ability to get their insurance at a better rate by six percent. You would definitely have to weigh that out, calculate it. Yeah. So how large of an employer are you? Oh, dang. Could you cut it down to 49? <laughs> share your venting because I work for a nonprofit that has 54 employees um, so we're, we're in a very similar position what I would say to you so I'm not a health insurance agent um, but what I would say to you is wait till October 1st until you make any sort of decision so that you can see what the actual costs are and then look at you know if it really is cheaper for some for your staff to go out and buy coverage on the marketplace and you are not going to face that, you know, is the penalty that you pay going to be less than what would have you spent on the health insurance? And then in it, and your health insurance advisor would, you know, also counsel you on options related to fine contribution, sort of like how we pay for 403Bs and retirement plans right now, where employers put in a certain percentage. There's a movement of employers that are doing something very similar with health insurance, where they say, we're going to spend this much on your health insurance, you take it, buy what you want. If you buy something more expensive, that's your business. If you buy what this pays for, good for you. But you should you should wait until October first and then talk yeah, it through. We've been talking for yeah. six months because the office is already. Yep, right? it's coming. It's coming, and I'm still looking. Twelve days. Okay, we've got what a year of free. Yep. Well, we have to pay the penalty, but it doesn't change how how dire it is for nonprofits who are living on shoestrings. That it's it. Yeah. So you want to be fair to everyone, but don't say fair to you. So that's my first event. Right there with you. 54. <laughs>
Yeah, I, I would just say if for the other, you know, 50 and above nonprofits in the room, the defined contribution option is something that's very um, interesting and might be really great for employees and actually save the nonprofit money in the long run. So something to think about. So how do these cost sharing subsidies, uh, how do they get applied automatically? But again, you know, so you don't have to apply for them separately. You don't have to check a box. You don't have to do anything other than be in that income level or be an American Indian or Alaskan Native and pick a silver plan. That's what you have to do. And if you do that, automatically apply, it's good to go. But if you don't do those things, you get nothing. What would you get your quote for that figure in? Uh, since it doesn't affect the price of the premium, it's not going to change anything that you see on the premium. But when the cost sharing, in terms of the cost sharing reduction on like your deductible or your copay, it will show you that. But again, it's only going to show you that in the silver plan. So this is a, a chart actually from a recent presentation that was done by the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. And if you're interested in seeing a little bit more around how uh, cost sharing gets applied, they've done a really nice job. They actually ran through several scenarios. So they took this guy and that lady that were in different income households and sort of different scenarios, and they ran through what's their premium going to be, and then how does cost sharing affect that, and so on and so forth. But this chart is sort of the, one of the biggest takeaways. So how the cost sharing reduction uh, works is we, so 70% actuarial value, that's the regular silver plan. What the cost sharing reduction does is make the plan pay more of the expenses. So normally if we picked a silver plan, it would have 70% actuarial value. If we're from 100 to up to 150, our actuary value with that cost sharing is gonna go up to 94%, meaning that instead of paying 30% of the cost of our expenses, we're gonna pay six. And that's how that works. So it works on the actuarial value by increasing it, making the plan pay more and the person pay less. And it's different for each category. So we have 100 to 150, that gets us to pay 6%, for 151 to 200, we're paying 13%. As we get to the 200 to 250, we're you know, getting a little bit closer to the regular silver plan. But for our people that are really low income, that's a, it's a pretty big deal to only pay 6% of the cost of your healthcare. Um, and there are, you know, how does that, it works on deductibles, it works on the maximum out-of-pocket limit, um, and then they've given a couple of examples on how that, how that might look. Again, this is based on simulated health insurance plan. So we can't say for sure that this plan's gonna have a $10 copay until we know October 1st. But this is based on the current health insurance market. They're saying that the difference between you know, cost sharing in the regular silver plan is that it would cost 30 bucks, and for the people that are getting that highest level of cost sharing, it would cost 10. Which is, it's a $20 difference. It's probably not the end of the world to all of us, but it is the end of the world to a lot of people, especially our folks with chronic conditions that are in once a month. Uh, $20 a month over 12 months is a pretty significant chunk of a lot of low-income folks' income. So this is huge potential to save real dollars for people, and the dollars where it counts the most to a low-income person, which is what's coming out of their pocket, not the premium and what that costs and what tax credit they're getting, especially since for a lot of the lower-income folks, that premium may be really, really low. So I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about how this application process works. Um, and it does, it works a little bit differently. So just a sort of a quick poll, who has experience with a, like a current Medicaid application for a child or a pregnant woman? Couple of you, okay. So um, some of the things that are baked into the health insurance marketplace have been experimented with in the current Medicaid application some of that electronic verification, some of the reduction in paperwork. We've done that for kids already in the state of Michigan. We haven't done it for adults. So this new process is much closer to what we currently do for kids. What we do for adults right now in the state of Michigan is a lot of paper, a lot of time, a lot of chasing down proof. Everybody that does that knows that it's a pain in the butt. Um, this new process works a little bit differently. So step one is that you create an account um, and this is an account-based system, and this account in the health insurance marketplace is what houses your information. So kind of a weird thing here, if you don't have an email address, you have to get one. Um, 
So that's something to think about with clients. If they don't have an email address, they have to get one for their account. Uh, you can still pick to receive paper correspondence if you absolutely want to, but the marketplace would much prefer to send it to you electronically. So I would just tell you it's going to default to that sort of option. You're, when you go through the first screen and you give the marketplace demographic information, you can check, I want to get correspondence on paper, or I want to get things in the mail. Um, that is still an option to folks, but it's definitely following a more electronic route. So first thing is creating an account. Uh, the second thing is actually, go ahead. Is that on the healthcare.gov? Yep. That you about that you want to? Exactly. Yeah, and up until um, last week, you could create an account. So you could do that before October 1st when the marketplace opens. Last week, they took down that option because they're adding all of the plans in. So right now, there's nothing. You can't do anything. Um, but before that, you could create an account in advance. And there are actually quite a few people were encouraging people to sign up for their accounts because if you had an account, you were going to get information sent to your email address to remind you to say, hey, now the marketplace is open, come, out, come on over and apply. Right now, you can't do that. I wish you still could because it was a great sort of step that people could take. Everybody wants to know, what can I do now? And for a little while, we could say, set up your marketplace account. That's a great thing to do. Um, can't say that right now because they're finishing the final software build. Um, so step two is applying, um, and that's the actual filling out of the forms. So that's going through demographic information, saying who's in the household, income information for that household, actually putting everything into the marketplace application. It is a dynamic system. So if you say that you're male, it's not going to ask you questions about being pregnant. Um, if you say that you're a woman, it will. Um, if you say there's one person in your household, it's going to show you a streamlined income thing so that you can possibly go through that income section in two screens, which is sort of this ideal scenario that I think will probably only apply to a very small percentage of the population, but that's what they put on the website. Um, if you have a more complicated income scenario, it's going to look a little bit more like that current application where we're saying, I have this job and this job and I make this much you know, annually or this much bi-weekly. I also get this much in SSI and that much in cash assistance and sort of going through all of the income sources for more complicated scenarios. So after you apply, healthcare.gov is going to tell you how much tax credit you're eligible for. You're going to tell it how much you want to use. Um, you're going to look at plans, so side by side, kind of look at all of the plan options for you. You're going to pick a plan, and then healthcare.gov is going to take you out to that plan for you to actually enroll. And I have a couple of uh, slides that just sort of illustrate what it looks like. Um, you can skip this. So there, back. there we go. So this is, for example, the first screen that you come to where you're putting in information about um, that person, their contact information, that sort of thing. <coughs> As you can see, running down the left-hand side, there are um, kind of waypoints. So it tells you where you're at in the process. And then for each of, each of these categories, so family and household, additional information, when you get to that section, it opens up, and then other checkpoints come in underneath it that sort of tell you and keep track of where you are in the process. So for the getting started, we had to agree to a privacy terms. We're doing our contact information. If we want to have an authorized representative, we can do that. Um, we, want to, we have to tell the marketplace that we want help paying for our coverage. It's not just going to assume that. So we have to actually say, yes, we're interested in finding out what tax credits we're eligible for. Because if we say no, all it's going to do is show us the plans without those tax credits. Go ahead. Do you have to complete the whole application in one sitting if you go out? You can save it. Okay. Yep. And I don't. This slide doesn't show up, but I think if you go to the next one, it'll show you. So oh. this the save buttons. So save when you click save and continue, it saves it and then takes you to the next portion. But if you need to stop, it saves it where you last clicked that button. Um, I'm told that it auto saves. You know, do we want to do we want to bet on that? I don't know. I would click the button a lot, but that's just me. a little overcautious sometimes. Um, so this is the expedited income scenario. This is what CMS has put out so far, um, where 
they, the federal marketplace has interacted in real time with IRS tax data. So we've told it a little bit of information about ourselves, our name, our social security number, those sorts of things. It went out to the federal data services hub. It said, yes, you're a citizen. This is how much money we, we, used, we say that you made last year. And we get this expedited income scenario where do we expect our yearly income for 2014 to be the same as what was reported on our 2012 income tax return? So we could say yes, or we could say no, and then we could change that number. So there is always an opportunity for people to say that it's different. There are, and I don't want to go too far into this, but there are reasonable compatibility standards around the difference between what was on your taxes and what you actually put in. So if you had a wild change in income, say it's, you know, you're making $20,000 less than you did on your last income return or $20,000 more, they're gonna ask you for some proof of that. If it's within a reasonably compatible range, which is, again, different based on every circumstance, and it's different in the marketplace than it is for Medicaid, the system knows, so we don't need to know that. It does that all in the background. Um, if it's in a reasonably compatible range, it's gonna trust you. It's an attestation model, so. But again, if you, if you don't tell it the truth, so say you lie and you say you made $20,000, but you really make 35 because you wanna get a cheaper health insurance premium and more tax credit, at the end of the year, you're gonna to have to pay back what you lied about. And the tax man is a lot less forgiving than the Medicaid office once was, so I just, I would keep that in mind because I'm not saying that that's the majority of folks, but I've done a lot of health insurance applications in my time, and I've seen a lot of people lie. Go ahead. So this is um, another thing that you have in your packet that I just want to draw attention to. And there is a form in here that says employer coverage tool. It's towards the back. Uh, one of the things that the marketplace looks for is for somebody to say they don't have coverage available through their employer. Because, in, Mary Ann said this this morning, if you have coverage available through your employer that meets that affordability standard, the marketplace tells you to go there. You're not eligible for tax credits. So this is the way that it knows. <laughs> you have to fill out a form. Uh, there is no magical database of the health coverage that employers offer. Gosh, I wish there was. That would make everybody's life a lot easier, but that doesn't exist. So this form right here is what, um, what we're going to give to the marketplace to tell them how, what our employer covers or what our employer doesn't cover in the case of somebody that's seeking tax credits. Now, generally speaking, I don't know about your guys' employers, but I have already been sent one of these by my employer. Um, that was already filled out that says everything about our health insurance plan and what it covers and what it doesn't cover and everything in between. So the concept is not that a person should have to fill this out. The concept is that a person should be able to go to their employer, likely their employer's HR equivalent, whoever or whatever that is, and get this form. That's the concept. And then return it to the marketplace. Because the marketplace wants to know that you don't have affordable coverage available to you because then you're eligible for the tax credit. So this is an important part. It's something that's different. We don't have this in an application process right now. And then plan selection. So this is actual the actual side by side. So we see our four metal levels. We see how many plans are being offered in each one of those categories. We're seeing within that category, the, high, the low premium, the high premium, this is sort of the widest level view of plan compare. So when you first come in, this is what you're going to see across all of those categories. If you go to the next slide, this is what it looks like when you're actually comparing plans. So plan one, plan two, plan three. Unfortunately, it'll only let you compare three at a time. It doesn't let your screen get eight plans across. It only lets you do three. Um, but you can see all sorts of things. So we can see Plan one has a cheaper premium. Their deductibles are all the same. Their out-of-pocket maxes are all the same. So somebody that's particularly price sensitive might pick you know, plan one. They also might look into more of the details about that plan. They might look at its provider network. They might look at co-pays or admissions costs or co-insurance amounts. They might you know, want to dive into more detail. I would encourage people to do that. I can't tell you that everybody will. 
Um, but the option is there for them. And, and this is really what it looks like. So obviously there's no information on it, but this is really what it looks like. It's pretty straightforward in terms of how people compare. Um, it's still a lot of information for people. So, you know, especially for somebody who's been uninsured for a long period of time, and they may have never done this before, you know, even for those of us that work in the healthcare industry, making our insurance choice can be a little um, tenuous sometimes. So I don't doubt that this will be confusing for many people in terms of how do we do that. What I can say, and you know, this is certainly an option for all of you, is that there are training programs available to help people assist those folks. Uh, navigator programs, certified application counselors programs, where the feds are training people to assist. So you, know, you can apply to be a certified application counselor. You can provide that assistance directly. You do have to be trained. You have to be designated by CMS, trained and certified to offer that assistance. Uh, if you are not designated by CMS, trained and certified, there are a lot of terrible things that could happen to us. More likely political than to the nature of your particular organization. But one of the concepts and sort of objections that opponents of the law have had is that people are going to get taken advantage of. So what we want to do is flood the streets with people that are trained and certified and all saying the same thing and working on a best interest standard. That's the goal. If we can do that, people are going to get help from the people that are being responsible and ethical. Um, and that's, you know, that's really the hope. We have to do that if we're going to combat, and you guys touched on this this morning, all of the scams and the fraud that are bound to happen and have already started to happen. Um, so we have to make that help available. And you know, somebody working in that assistance role is really out there to ask the right questions to lead people to picking a plan. So one of the first questions that that sister might start with is, what's practical for your budget? Can you afford $170 a month, or do we need to, do we need to look at a cheaper plan? How much could you, um, you know, do you already have a healthcare provider? Okay, well, is your healthcare provider in that plan's network? You can narrow it down by asking some of the right questions and guide people without saying, pick this plan, because we don't want to do that. So I want to touch real briefly just in terms of where people are at with the marketplace. There's been a lot of messaging and polling. Um, and the messaging and polling um, is tough. It's, there are some really tough numbers in here. So what we've heard from messaging and market research is that 78% of folks don't know about the new health insurance marketplace. Uh, we very recently, actually two weeks ago, a new poll came out that is a little bit more up to date than this one. And what that poll showed is that more people have learned, but a lot more people have become against as well. So previously we had just people that didn't know. Now we have more people that do know, but don't support. Um, so we have a lot of work to do when it comes to awareness and getting impartial information and fair information out to people. Just when we look at the Medicaid expansion audience, that number is even higher. So amongst the Medicaid eligible, even less people know that Medicaid expansion is coming. And because a lot of people have applied for Medicaid previously and been rejected, there's this added layer around having a previous rejection and not thinking that you're eligible. The health insurance marketplace is brand new. So we don't have that challenge to overcome. Whereas with Medicaid, people have some memory with the program. So people think that health insurance is important, but their level of interest is what the researchers call soft. When you ask people, is health insurance important? They obviously respond yes. They say yes, of course it's important, at an overwhelming level, 91%. But when you start talking about how much you're gonna pay for it, that interest goes down a little bit. Um, there are some strategies and there are some messages that get people back from from that place. So as we, as no doubt, cost and affordability were people's biggest barriers. That's why people are uninsured right now. It's too expensive. Um, financial and health security are the biggest motivators. And I will say, especially for men. The, the market research says that men are overwhelmingly motivated by security from medical bankruptcy and debt. So that's a big message. For women, the message is not debt. 
the message is uh, plan security so that you'll be protected when something terrible happens or if something terrible happens, you have that peace of mind. There's a lot of skepticism and confusion, partially because this law was passed what seems like ages ago and nobody's been able to do anything yet. So there's, they've heard a lot, they heard a lot when the Affordable Care Act was passed and then there was the Supreme Court decision, and then we had the Medicaid expansion battle in Michigan. They've seen it in the news, they've heard their friends and family talk about it. They don't understand what has happened and what has transpired over the history of time. You go to the next one. So all of the bad news to say there's plenty of good news. Um, market research suggests that if you can say four things to people, these four things, so these four boxes, you hit the top motivator for almost 90% of the population. So 90% of people everywhere are motivated by one of these four things. And if you can get all four of them across, you're gonna hit somebody's key motivator and open a door. This is a messaging gold mine. It's rarely this simple. Um, I'm a PR person by nature, so I've seen these lists be 10 things long, and then you have to figure out how to combine them in 13 different ways to get those messages across. This concept that we have four things that reach 90% of the population, that's a big deal. So arm yourself with these four things. We want to make sure that people know it's a comprehensive plan. So we want to relate the concept of the essential health benefits in a way that people can understand. So we want to say all of the insurance plans have to cover doctor's visits, hospitalizations, ER care, prescriptions, and maternity. Those obviously are not the whole list of essential health benefits. These are the things that were statistically proven to be most important to people. I don't know why. And it just is. So I, presumably because this is what people use the most of, or they have the most experience with these things, or they're most worried about what they're paying for them now. For example, the reason that prescriptions are on that list is because drugs cost people so much money. We know that. Um, the second thing is that if you have a pre-existing condition, the plan can't deny you. This is a smaller group of the population that's motivated by this, but for the people that are motivated by this, it's extremely important. So we include that as a key message. We say that you may be able to get financial help to help pay for a health insurance plan. We don't want to commit to the fact that something is going to be free or low cost. We used to say that all the time. So we would say low cost or free health insurance is available. I can't confidently say that. So we want to say financial help and we'll help you through an application to figure out what exactly that means for you. And then the last thing, and this is sort of the um, forgotten part of the Affordable Care Act, but the Affordable Care Act actually changed how health insurance companies talk about their products. So that removed fine print, people are gonna be able to get access to information, simple language, no fine print. This is a very high percentage of the population that's motivated by that fact, and it's one that we often forget. So when we talk about the Affordable Care Act, even with our colleagues or our clients, we talk about insurance expansion, pre-existing conditions, kids on their parents' plan, uh, new free preventative services. Those are the things that we incentivize. We don't talk a lot about the changes to the insurance industry or the fact that the health insurance company is no longer allowed to attach 15 pages of eight point font that do all the terms and disclaimers to everything. That's really important to people. People hate that. We hate that. I can venture a guess you hate that. Everybody hates it. And it's not going to happen. And it's especially not going to happen if you're shopping in the health insurance marketplace. So that's a very, very important thing to emphasize when you're having that conversation with folks. So before we kind of stop and take some questions, um, I just wanted to put out there what are some of the opportunities that you have to help people. I'm assuming that for many of you, you've seen this before. Um, but I always like to reiterate things. So. You know, if you, uh, at the very bottom of the page, if, if you feel like what you can do as an organization is try and educate your people and then refer them to the people that are offering enrollment assistance, there's a job for you. It's called being a champion for coverage. Um, and that's the job. So the job is sign up to be a champion for coverage, put flyers up, put brochures out, put stuff on your website, talk to your folks and then get them referred to the people that are providing enrollment assistance directly. That's a really important part of this equation. 
Uh, we need a lot of people to provide enrollment assistance. We need even more people just to talk about it. You know the old saying that you have to hear something seven times before it sinks in? It's now 11 times at a minimum. So we need people to hear this, and we need them to hear it over and over and over. I need them to see it at their healthcare provider, at the social service agency, on Facebook, on a billboard. I need their mom to talk about it with them before I even have a hope of getting them to take an enrollment action. So that's a really important thing. The other thing, if you wanna provide that enrollment assistance directly is to become a certified application counselor. And that's an option, uh, it's an option that was made available by CMS specifically for agents that had a little bit of experience under their belt. So if, you're ap if your agency does you know, a mom's application right now, a my child application right now, and you just do it because that's part of your work, which is where you know, most of my members are, that's where we are as an organization, it's part of our work to get people enrolled in coverage because we want them to get health care. This is the option for us. So you apply to be a designated organization, CMS designates you, you sign a contract with CMS that says you're going to agree to the terms and conditions and you're going to follow the rules. All of your staff go through training, they get certified, you start enrolling people. There are lots of navigator grantees, four of them. Um, all four of them have some presence in Southeast Michigan. They're everywhere. <laughs> they're growing, they're hiring people, they're doing all sorts of things. So depending on the population that you serve, there may be a navigator grantee that's a little specialized. So American Indian Health and Family Services, which is based in Detroit, was funded as a navigator with some particular emphasis on that American Indian Alaskan Native population. Access in Dearborn was funded as a navigator with some particular emphasis on Arabic, Chaldean, and refugee populations. So if that's part of your audience, that might be a really good place for people to get direct enrollment assistance. Michigan Consumers for Healthcare was funded with a statewide program, sort of as the general navigator across the whole state of Michigan. They took a regional approach. Um, in each, the state's divided into regions. There are lead navigators in every region. There are local navigators in every region. So there is that support available. Uh, and there are certainly opportunities to engage with each of those programs. They're looking for partners. They're looking for people to share information. They're looking for people to become local navigators and host outreach events and do all sorts of things like that. So with that, I wanna point you just to, oh, towards two things. If you haven't already spent a lot of time on these websites, and many of you probably have, but healthcare.gov in the top left corner, that's where our marketplace lives. So when people wanna sign up for coverage on October 2nd, I, they may wanna sign up on October 1st, but I'm trying not to think about that day. Um, they want to sign up on October 2nd, <laughs> they go to healthcare.gov. That's where you create your account, that's where you apply, that's where you select your plan. Everything is done there. Uh, the marketplace.cms.gov website is for partners, and many of you have probably explored it already, but there's a whole group of materials that have been pre-created, articles, widgets for your website, social media messages, things for your newsletter, uh, the place where you apply to be a champion for coverage, be a certified application counselor, all on that website. That website is just, just for us, just for the partners. Healthcare.gov is what faces the consumer audience. And with that, I think I will take more questions. Once you enroll, so let's say you have the gun call first line from the second enroll, changes his mind. Can he disenroll and go into another plan? Prior to January 1st? Yes. Okay. Um, depending on the day of the month. <laughs> so the, for, the first, for the first 15 days of the month, so if you enroll, for example, October 1st through, that's a bad example. Let's say January 1st through January 15th, okay. your coverage is going to start on February 1st. If you enroll the 15th through the 31st, your coverage is going to start March 1st. So if you're in the first 15 days of the month, your coverage starts the next month. If you're in the second 15 days of the month, it starts the first day of the following month. So if you enroll in a plan on October, your coverage is set to start January 1. If you change your mind by uh, December 15th, <laughs> you could still start January 1st. But if you did it on December 16th, you were gonna start February 1st. 
just uh, just like open enrollment, really how we handle my child right now. So, you know, if you enroll in a my child plan at the end of the month, it takes until the first of the following month for you to actually get coverage. It's the same concept in the health insurance marketplace. You can also drop marketplace coverage at any time. So there's no sort of um, penalty for dropping or anything like that. Uh, the thing that people should know though is that if they drop that coverage voluntarily and we're no longer in open enrollment, we can't get you reapplied unless you have one of those special life circumstances that Mary Ann alluded to this morning. So things like having a baby, getting divorced, getting married, losing coverage. You know, say your employer has coverage and then one day they decide they're not gonna do it anymore, that would qualify you to enroll in the exchange. But if you just cancel your coverage and you say, I don't want it anymore, um, and it's outside of open enrollment, you're, you're really uh, not in a great situation. But I know where we can find out. Let's talk afterward. I know who can tell you that. So the person started their enrollment process on their own and they got stuck and had other questions and they went into a, a provider with a CAC where they could help them. Would they be able to see that as information? Will their application be saved? Yep. Yep. They could also uh, do live chat in real time. So, you know, throughout the application, there are these little help tabs. So if you get stuck in a place, there is text that you click on and it prompts and it explains what something is to you. And the text was written not for an assister, but for an actual person. So the text is meant to be explanatory to help, you know, bring somebody past an obstacle. But there are also, throughout the whole application, there's always opportunities that are prompting people to say, call us, you know, initiate live chat. Um, that's, you know, those are options that are available to people. They can also just save and exit and then go to a certified application counselor or navigator. That's certainly an option as well. But I would be um, grossly overselling the capacity of assisters if I said that everybody is gonna get help one-on-one. -on -one. There aren't enough of us to do that. So we really do need some people to do the application themselves. Um, and I think, you know, prioritizing use of those help resources as a way to get more people to do the application themselves. You know, we have a small army. I can say, you know, in the health center community, we have 175 people statewide who all they do is help people sign up for health insurance. And at this point, they're doing, you know, almost a thousand applications a month in the current system. I can only imagine what that's gonna look like when open enrollment starts. Um, but there, there are just too many people affected. It's, you know, it's close to 1.2 million people when we get down to the end of the day for every single person to get one-on-one -on -one assistance. So we do need some people to do it on their own. And I think Michigan has some pretty good track record with use of online systems. So if you look at the statistics for who completes an application themselves for my child or through my bridges, it's a decent chunk of the people that apply that are actually doing it themselves. And we really need to keep that and tr take it with us to the next application. Uh, if they haven't started already, everyone. everyone. But so some people opened early. So if, we, if somebody calls into that national line, I mean, is that going to be a lot of states? Of yep. Okay. yep. So all of the federally facilitated marketplaces and the federal parker, partnership marketplaces all are all starting on October 1st. But there have been a couple of states that chose to start a little bit early, like California, for example. They opened Covered California um, earlier this week. I think it was Monday. If they move from state to state, can they keep that same one they had signed up for? Or do they have to pick a new one that's in that area? That's a, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, if that health insurance plan happens to also be in the other state, I suppose they could keep it, but I find that very unlikely. So they'd have to disenroll on that one. Yeah. There are, there are multi-state and national plans available, um, but I don't think that most people will enroll in those plans. I think most people will pick a plan that they know, that is, you know, they've seen signs for, that they have people that 
just because of the name recognition alone. So it's very unlikely to have somebody enrolled in Michigan in priority in West Michigan that they would be able to take that with them to Ohio because priority doesn't exist there.